heard Joe Amadola go. All right. All right. We're good to maybe get going. I think a few folks are trickling in here. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. We just took a, a few minutes to set up uh, a camera just to record this. We're recording all of our town halls, and we're going to do a town hall, at least one, in every single county of the district. Uh, this may surprise some of you uh, who have had Congresswoman Stefanik as your representative for quite some time. I know that she hasn't uh, made herself available in such a way. We're not just going to make ourselves available personally. We're going to post stuff online so that folk, folks can have access to us and hear what kinds of questions and issues are being raised throughout uh, the district. Uh, what I'll start off with doing is introducing myself, because I think I've had the opportunity to meet with some of you. You've had an opportunity to hear about who I am and why I'm running, but I'm going to start off with that. I'm Matt Castelli. I'm running for Congress here in the 21st Congressional District against Congresswoman Lisa Uh Upstate New York guy, born and raised down in the Hudson Valley, but went to Siena College, which is the eastern portion of this massive district of 15 counties. And when I was in college, 9-11 uh, happened. That became a driving force for my career. I went and joined the CIA after that, uh, led teams hunting down some of the world's most dangerous terrorists. I actually worked in the very same department that found Osama bin Laden, as well as this most recent effort that took down the Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri. Those were my friends that did that work. I did comparable work hunting after uh, similar bad guys and served in places like Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and had enough success doing all of that work that I was tapped by the Obama White House to come on down and serve as the director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council a role I was asked by the Trump administration to stay on it, and I did, for the first year of the Trump White House. Because if I learned anything throughout my career in public service, it's that when it comes to protecting our nation, protecting our community, my family and yours, it requires us to put country before party. And my belief in that has never wavered. Now, I did some work back at CIA after that experience with technology startups, got a business degree out at Northwestern, and then COVID hit. Now, my grandfather was an Army doctor at West Point gets out of the army, remains a physician, and he raises a family of nurses. All of my aunts, uncle, nurses, with the exception of my mother, she's a teacher. She served in a different way. But my grandpa instilled within our family a sense of duty, a duty to care for others. So when COVID hit, we got to a point pretty quickly in the pandemic where we were having a 9-11 every single day in this country. It was the most compelling challenge of our time. So after 15 years at the CIA, I left government and joined a healthcare organization here in New York, started by a couple of veterans, to better coordinate care for veterans, rural communities, connecting health and social care together. Our human and social service providers in the community, that's where health and well-being happens. I was building out coordinated care networks throughout the Northeast, loved what I was doing, and then January 6th happened. As you might imagine, a former counterterrorism guy who spent a career trying to prevent things like that from happening in foreign capitals, to see it happen in our own didn't sit well with me. But certainly, too, the response we saw from Congresswoman Stefanik. I think she turned her back on our democracy that day. I think she violated her oath to the Constitution, same oath that I took when I joined the CIA many years ago. And so not long after that, we decided to launch this campaign uh, in order to honor the same oath that I took to the Constitution, to support and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, the campaign we've been building ever since has been uh, off to the races. We've been in uh, the midst of redistricting. Maps are now set. We have a big district, 15 different counties, and we've been in all of them. We've been pretty relentless in making sure we are available to folks, having meet and greets, listening tours, now doing town halls, and chatting with folks across the political spectrum to hear what are some of the top issues that matter to them. I put over 35,000 miles on my truck so far in this campaign. I suspect we'll do another 30,000 before the campaign is over. We've done over 250 uh, events. We're building a strong volunteer base that's helping us with this Democratic primary that we're in right now. If any of you happen to be registered Democrats and have not voted yet in this primary, I would encourage you to look to the 23rd on August 23rd. That's the primary, but we actually are in the midst of an early voting period right now that runs through the 21st. So uh, I'd be honored to earn your vote in that primary. But we're building a strong campaign that I believe can defeat Elise Stefanik in no small part because we're building a coalition, not just Democrats, independents and Republicans as well. And one of the things we established in this race is an independent line on the ballot called the Moderate Party. We collected a tremendous number of signatures for that. Uh, this was an opportunity for us to engage with voters across the political spectrum, not just Democrats, engage their interest in trying to see someone that might represent the middle of the road. Because I hear from folks that are a little tired of the extremism and the divisiveness in our politics, and they'd like someone that could bring us together. So this Moderate Party is a great opportunity to help us build that coalition. 
So I feel very strong about our chances here. We're building a strong campaign that can defeat Elise Stefanik. But one of the important things, I think, is showing up and hearing from folks. Um, and this is an opportunity, as I've traveled throughout the district, where some of the new counties that have been added to New York 21, uh, they actually used to be a part of New York 19. So Antonio Delgado, who's now the Lieutenant Governor, this is an area that some of the districts, uh, the counties of Rensselaer, Schoharie, Otsego County, a portion of Montgomery County, those folks helped flip that district from red to blue in support of Antonio Delgado. And one of the good things that I've heard about Antonio in, in his tenure is that he always showed up and did town halls with folks. And so that's a, a pattern that we'd like to not just replicate, but probably outdo. Because I believe it's important. This is at least the bare minimum, I think, we should expect out of our representatives to show up and listen to us, to be heard, to offer their thoughts. Now, the main difference between me today and what you may have heard or had an opportunity to hear from sitting members of Congress is that I'm not a sitting member of Congress. I don't have any legislation that I can point you to that I'm working on. But hopefully we'll get to that point in the next couple of months after we win this election in November. So what I'd like to do here today is just open it up, hear from you about some of the issues that are of top of concern, happy to try to address any questions that you may have in terms of my thinking, what I've heard from others in the district, and I'll be upfront if I don't have an answer to that question, and we'll work hard to go get it. And so with that, I would love to open the floor up and also uh, identify that we'll probably preserve about five or 10 minutes at the very end here. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question in front of a large crowd, I'll be available, come up, we can meet one-on-one, -on -one, and you can ask your question in person, okay? Great. Okay, who won the election? Joe yeah. Biden. Okay. <laughs> I assume that's the election you were asking about. <laughs> Go for it. I was happy to hear you're including everyone because with our current rep, you never felt once. Yeah. She, she ignores everyone except those in her party. I have a senator phone calls, never could get a question through because I'm not. So I, I appreciate that. The other thing up in this area and in this district, I think, is the biggest issue is jobs, good jobs. And you've got Walmart, you've got McDonald's, you've got Burger King, you've got drug stores, you've got the service industry. What can be done to attract more steady businesses up here yeah. to this district? It's a great question. Did everybody hear it? What can be done to attract uh, businesses, employers, so we can be creating good paying jobs? Because uh, we've all seen, and certainly even in areas here, you know, whether GM plants or Alcoa, you know, the opportunities that we've had in the past. My dad was a long time IBMer. Uh, the big business and the concept of working for a single employer for the, you know, 35 years, that doesn't exist anymore, right? So the ability to make sure that within our communities, we are attracting multiple employers that folks can navigate through a career. But that incurs a degree of risk, right? I was a long time government employee. The prospect of when I left government to get a private sector job, that was scary. I needed to make sure that I was gonna earn enough money, navigate healthcare, uh, navigate a healthcare exchange. There are a lot of factors that create challenges for those of us who may be navigating our way through the private sector. Now, I think the approach that many of our local uh, environments, whether it's a state or local government, have taken in terms of attracting employers has always been about, let's create some sort of tax incentive, we can bring an employer here, but we've all seen the examples where the economics don't work for them anymore, and they pull chalk, they leave, and they leave a community devastated. We need to be making investments in our community, and when we do that, we create a degree of resiliency, we create an opportunity for infrastructure, and I don't mean just roads and bridges and broadband, which are things that we need. Broadband and cell service, so that's a bare basic requirement now for a small business or an educator or whatever it may be. So we do need to make those investments. But the kinds of investments that attract and retain talent are childcare, affordable housing, the opportunity for an employer to come here and access a talent pool that's going to be useful to helping grow their business. Now, this is where I think we get a little bit of a philosophical difference between maybe Democrats and Republicans. And I'm gonna take a, a sort of a business approach to this. I did go to business school, put that hat on, take the CIA hat off. If you wanna grow a business, you have to make investments in it. If you wanna grow our economy, we gotta make investments in it. 
and the areas that have long gone unaddressed these days are around, do we have access to healthcare facilities? Do we have childcare? Do we have elder care? Do we have you know, good schools that allow for a community to be able to come together? So I think if we take a community-centric model and start making resources available to make the kinds of uh, resources available that allow a community to thrive, those are the kinds of things that will attract employers to be here or enable folks to start a small business. So I think that that's a real interesting and good approach to all of this. I've actually been encouraged by what the state has done around the downtown revitalization initiatives. And I think that that's a, a model that could be maybe supercharged with some federal dollars. And I'd like to see you know some efforts around that. It seems to me that between Watertown and Plattsburgh or wherever, we could have a bunch of small, clean, green, high-tech firms like Newmed and Hopkinton, right? Right. I mean, they're not all college graduates, right. but, but a lot of the college graduates, we got a brain drain from here. Yeah. Whether you went to SUNY Canton or SUNY Potsdam or Clarkson right. or St. Lawrence, you know, they've got to leave this area. But if you have, if you promote, and there are a fair number of small, clean, green, high-tech firms already in this, in this congressional district. But if we promoted those, that kind of thing, uh, I think we could get, get the, right, the right combination of, of, of jobs out here. Absolutely. This is an area, I don't know to tell you high this. Tech, we high all tech. know it's high tech, great paying, potential union jobs. Green. Green collar, green collar jobs, right? Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to leverage the wonderful natural resources that exist within the North Country. Yeah. We've got plenty of wide open spaces, we've got a lot of wind, we've got a lot of water. These are an opportunity for us to not even just drive the uh, energy efficiency and diversification from New York State, potentially even for the Northeast. The Messina Electric Company was built by somebody from Aquasazni. Yeah. yeah. You're, you know. And I think you're spot on in terms of making sure that we're keeping the kinds of talent that we're training here and providing education to. There are a lot of resources. And again, this is also a place where people want to stay, right? It's a beautiful place to live. That's why I live here. But how can we make sure that we're giving the kinds of resources that allow people to thrive here? That's what's been missing. And we certainly haven't had a representative in the last eight years advocating for these kinds of investments, or maybe even working at least in a collaborative fashion. I'm not asking her to switch parties, but could you work in some sort of collaborative fashion with lawmakers in Albany or the governor to make sure that federal dollars do, get to, uh, do come to our state, actually end up in our district? I think that's one of the challenges and why we haven't seen that in the last eight years. Uh, I think we do a poor job, the Democrats, of getting the message of what's happening. Yeah. This part of Biden signed the bill today. But, I mean, the people that the Democrats over the years have helped, they, they're real, they won't come out and vote. Yeah. I've been involved in town, town government, and call them up, oh, I'll be there. Well, if you look on the vote, they don't come. But somehow, you got to connect that, you know, like, uh, insulin bill. I mean, there's certainly a lot of people, and, but somehow that they can see this is going to happen to me, you know, yeah. or you know the other uh, the you know Medicare uh, uh, negotiations for drugs, right? Right. We, you know, I think that you you have to let people know that we're working for you, and a lot of good things have happened, and uh, but they have to black and white almost, that's, uh, that's money. Yeah, I think. I think you've talked about that. Right. We've been involved in this for a long time. Former President Trump was running against Hillary. I sat in restaurants in different places. Our labor people from here will not go with the Democrats because they weren't telling the story that here it is. They thought we left yeah. the Democrats. That has got to resonate throughout all the election parties. Yep. I think that's spot on and exactly right. And I'll, you know, true to form, country before party, I'll give credit to the former President Trump. He spoke to a segment of the American public that had long gone unaddressed by both parties. And we need to do a better job of making sure, and this is something that we're trying to do, making sure everyone has access, is to speak to everyone. I don't care where you live, I don't care what party you're a part of. I'm seeking and applying for a job to be your representative, to advocate for your best interests in Washington, 
to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our community, making the kinds of investments that are necessary. I think one of the other things that, if I can offer my uh, sort of punditry on sort of the state of where we're at right now as a nation, when I talk to folks throughout our community, I hear a lot of insecurity in people's voices. I think certainly after two years of a de deadly pandemic, I think as we watch the events unfold on January 6th and see the insecurity about our democracy, I think insecurity around inflation and the challenges on a global basis and can we tackle these big challenges that are facing our country and the intractable problems that seem to divide Americans rather than bring us together. And so folks are focused on insecurity and security issues. Now, I could tell them folks in some places, my last name Castelli, those of you who are Italian know that it means castle in Italian. And so providing a sense of safety and security and strength is really a part of who I am. And certainly I had the opportunity to do that in our national security, protecting us from terrorism. But we wanna talk about security issues to everyone in a different sort of lens, because it is about the economic security. It's about job security. It's about the security that comes from knowing that you're gonna have access to healthcare. That's the kind of security people are longing for. And so when we talk about security issues, we wanna make sure that we're appealing to everyone in that regard. How do you make them listen to you? Jerry's right. <laughs> they don't vote. And they, they, yeah. they say all this stuff, but they don't pay attention to what's actually going on, like that big bill that's out there right yeah. now that Biden just passed, signed. Yeah. Nobody knows about it because of everything that happened in Florida. Yeah, and, and I, I hope that I'm not going to be held completely responsible for the White House's uh, need and to do a better job of messaging what they've been doing no, over not, the past but, uh, two years. But, you know, is, no, but I think you're, you're, your point is exactly right, is to make sure that folks understand what's going on, what we're voting on, and to hold account folks like Congresswoman Stefanik about her record. Now, she's the number three in House Republican leadership. Her, her job is the message in chief. She's going to be carrying forward a message in this midterm cycle uh, against the president and uh, the Democrats in power. Technically, that's her job. But it, our, <laughs> our job is to make sure that this is a referendum on her. Are you going to have a chance to debate her? That's our expectation. Now, it will require so. us to make sure we win this primary. Uh, so I'll emphasize again, if you're a registered Democrat, <laughs> you go out and vote. Uh, but we, we'll be calling for some right away. But if you look at actually Congresswoman Stefanik's record, over the last eight years, pretty poor as a legislator. Yeah. Two bills, that's it. Exactly. But she's gone from sponsorship to passage into law. A commemorative coin and the renaming of a post office. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> now I'm sure that those were important to some people, but they don't rise to the top of the stamp. list. What she signed on for a new stamp. I'd <laughs> right. like to call that the stamp act. <laughs> <laughs> And so we hear a lot of complaining, we hear a lot of you know, press releases, but when you actually look at her record in terms of what she's accomplished, it's quite poor. We also can point out her record of voting against certain things. I think voting against our security. She votes against the investments that will help grow our economy. She votes against veterans' health and education benefits. Those of you who understand now that I served in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, we have a tremendous challenge with the burn pit exposure, the toxic fumes that many folks that I served alongside that were, had prolonged exposure to, have cancers now from. There was a common sense bill to make sure we get them health care coverage. Any of you who may have served previously, maybe Vietnam veterans, know about Agent Orange, and can replicate those kinds of examples to what we're facing with this generation of service members. She voted against it. And so we're going to have to call her out in every single turn to make sure we're educating voters about what her actual record is. And that's what this race will be all about. That's why you need to debate her once you win the primary. <laughs> Have you got any support from NYSE or AFT? I just, in this last week, it's almost like you were a planted question. Um, <laughs> just in the last couple of days, we received the, the full endorsement from NYSE. Okay, good. My mother, How about the AFL CIO? I believe they're having their conference right now. This week is their conference to determine what they're going to be doing in this Have summer. it both nicely. Yes. Your reputation has to show up. Yes. It's important, in my opinion, to get her support. Yes. My mother was a union teacher. Uh, I, I feel very, very strongly we should be uh, treating our teachers like veterans and paying them like surgeons. They are, I always, I mean, I have a profound level of respect for the profession as a son of a union teacher uh, to say thank you for their service because it is true service to our community. They're not just educating the next generation and preparing them for careers or making sure they have basic skills. They're preparing them to be good citizens. And it's a heavy burden that we place on our teachers to make sure at the center, the heart of our community where people come together and learn how to be a community, 
we're tasking our teachers with that responsibility. And we need to make sure that they're well resourced, that they're provided with trust and confidence. And right now, one of the key challenges, and I think why an organization like NYSED has removed their endorsement from Congresswoman Stefanik and placed it on me in this race, and I'm grateful for that, is that she's been tearing our communities apart Folks have seen throughout the North Country, she's been creating division between our parents and teachers, our parents and schools. It only seeks to divide us rather than empowering the kind of trust and trusted relationship that has long existed between parents and teachers. We should be empowering that and encouraging that, not creating division in our communities. You talked about the, the infrastructure. I have heard about high-speed internet since Hillary Clinton. <laughs> When she was first lady, yeah, or when she was our senator, right. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you make it thirty-seven dollars a month, basic fifty-seven dollars a month, if you can't get it to the people out in the country in the rural areas. Yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, school bus would be going out to a crossroads so kids could do something to get their classes in. We've got to reach. It seems it gets to the major city or the major town. Yeah. And there you are. No, this is a, a key challenge. It's 2022. There's no excuse anymore for not having high speed internet throughout much of our community. And everybody talks about, yeah, it's the hardest problem because it's that last mile. You gotta go that extra distance, whether it's underground or connecting to a pole, or whatever it may be. In my view, that should have been the first place we started, the hardest area, rather than providing it downstate and elsewhere. This is a challenge, I think, as a result, too, for not having, over the last eight years, an advocate, and our representative, who is gonna take and work hand in hand with the state government to make sure that those resources get here. Right now, there is a bipartisan infrastructure bill that does include resources for rural broadband. Stefanik voted against it, but we need to make sure that there's someone who's gonna advocate to get those resources here and get the job done because it is a basic level requirement for our businesses, for our schools, for our families, and it needs to get done. Now, now to open up a can of worms, but what about transportation? What about I-98? I There's been all kinds of talk for years about that. It would open up the whole North Country. I was looking at the Diocese of Ogdensburg today, from Alex Bay all the way to Plattsburgh. There's eight counties. There's no way to get around of northern New York. We got the power, we got the water. We do not have the interstate. Yeah. We don't have transportation. Lieutenant Governor Dun Lundin, when he was in power, if you go to northern New western New York, you'll see from Erie down to Pittsburgh, I-86. Lundin lives in Jamestown. You got I-86. Yeah. The same thing with 87 going north from Montreal to Albany. Representative Barkley, he, Northern, um, a New York State rep, put that through, got that through. Right now, with all this infrastructure, infrastructure money, you know, even though Stefanik's a Republican, why didn't she jump on that and go with Biden and build the interstate for us yeah. in Northern New York? <laughs> Look what that has done. Yeah. We have nothing up here, no way to get around. Yeah. When General Motors started, we had great expectations. Small employers wanted to come in here, nothing ever happened. Yeah. It's 37 all the way or 11, and there's just no way to, to get around. To follow it, it, up on you, have you ever tried following one of those impellers off a windmill <laughs> as you're coming out of the port of Augsburg? Forget it. Yeah, as someone who spends a lot of time on these roads <laughs> and has to cr crisscross, all across this district, I feel the pain in terms of the, the challenges of uh, transportation and the lack of that basic level infrastructure to connect our communities together, to allow for folks to have access to those resources, to have access to economic opportunities, to jobs, to be able to transport goods. This is a thing that always also like ties back into economic drivers. Many of our agricultural industry, our farms, dairy, they need to be able to get goods elsewhere. And the basic level infrastructure like roads that can connect places and allow for not being stuck behind the propeller, uh, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that we're gonna need. But we're gonna need some work, I think, also at the local level to make sure at the state and local level, we have folks that are willing to work in a collaborative fashion to recognize these challenges and do work towards them. Federal government, I think, is making resources available, certainly with this bipartisan infrastructure bill. We need to have 
all levels of government willing to work together to address the basic needs in our community. In 19, when Bill Clinton was in power, everything was set to start I-98. The very end, the chairman of the New York State Democratic Party, I forgot his name, but I talked to him at that time. It was all set at the, at the very end, the power, the, the more democratic vote for power in other parts of the country got the, got the money to build, build their interstate. In the meantime, up here, we're just, we're just isolated. Yeah, I mean, this is a key challenge across many issues in terms of what's going on at the state level. And I wanna make sure that there are strong voices advocating for upstate. Um, a lot of power and resources wind up going downstate. We need strong voices that are gonna represent upstate, that when we're passing laws, that we're advocating for resources to, to make their way up here. And that requires a, a strong voice that's gonna represent the upstate area. Uh, two questions, abortion and gay marriage? Yeah, both together, come on. <laughs> uh, so, so, First take your abortion. First. Sure, so women, You're uh, we should trust women and empower them to have the right to control their own bodies, uh, their health care decisions, okay. without any interference from the government. Strong advocate, uh, but that's not just a right that we need to protect, it's now we need, one we need to fight for. Because as we've seen with this Dodds decision, sure. uh, the rights of millions of American women are in jeopardy all yeah, across okay. this nation. We may feel like we're safe here in New York, but it's only a matter of time before uh, extremists like Elise Stefanik are advocating and pushing forward a nationwide abortion. And there are open questions about if you were traveling elsewhere and sought re reproductive health care. And so the only way to make that, uh, to protect that, and to make sure we reinstate those protections, what I believe to be an American freedom, okay. we need to be able to pass uh, legislation at the federal level to codify. Now, gay marriage, I believe everybody should be, also this is an American freedom. To be who you are, love who you love, that's something we should support. I'm encouraged to see some bipartisan support uh, on the Hill right now in trying to make that into law as well. Because we've seen, not just with the Dodge decision, but some uh, references in there to coming after some of those rights. I believe these to be individual liberties. And these are freedoms that we should protect and advocate for. Overall, we need a voice up here. The last eight years we haven't had one. When Bill Owens was our congressional rep, he was here. He was talking. I was a union president at a local facility that's closed now at the time. I talked to him every other week or so. Yeah. At least Stefana came to our union hall just after she was elected. We hadn't heard from her since then. Through emails, through other things. Yeah. The only time that we once did is we went to Washington to meet with her over issues. What union are, are you with? I'm with the Steelworkers. Oh, great. Yeah. Here Makes locally, sense. we cover the people at Alcoa, our yep. Pontiac, local railroad, the mine and governor. Yep. We have areas all over. We haven't seen the representation that we should have. Right yeah. Especially from a union standpoint. So maybe the companies have, maybe other people yeah. have. Yeah. But from a labor standpoint, yep. we've not seen it. Well, Stefanik is no friend to labor. No, she's no. not. She's not. She's she's not. really not. Um, and we've seen even recently, she's put forward a bill that's calling into question uh, overtime uh, yeah. protections. Over the, over the farm, farm, farm. No, 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 this is at a federal level about oh. gig workers. Oh. And oh. many of the protections that unions have been fighting for for the past century mm -hmm. uh, would be jeopardized if this bill were to go forward. And so she is someone that has, I think, been anti-labor throughout oh, much yeah. of her tenure. <laughs> she talks a good game in, in, in one side of her mouth about supporting some of the building trades, but in reality, she's uh, fighting against every potential project labor agreement that would come with federal dollars. Uh, so I'm proud to have the support of the UAW, as well as uh, NYSA, hopefully we'll bring in some others on board. Proud to have the support of Bill Owens in this race. He endorsed us early on. We were actually with him uh, this past weekend, uh, getting voters out. Uh, and uh, a good friend probably of yours, Ernie LaBaff. Uh, so many folks here know Ernie. Ernie's an institution. I'm, I'm proud and encouraged to have his support in this. But you're exactly right. Uh, and I believe that regardless of what organization you are a part of, a representative should be a representative for everyone. And if a constituent or a group or an organization comes to you and asks you for help or wants to ask a question or just vent, that's your job to be there. And I think it's a good point also that once we get you through the primary, my opinion, <laughs> once we get you through it, that we stress these votes that Elise has taken yep. against diabetics medication. That is huge. Anything to do with medical care these days, 
that can save money in the people's pockets around here. That is huge. And it really needs to be stressed because she said no. Yep. There's a reason she said no. She got the money in her pocket rather than yours. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about corporate PAC money from the pharmaceutical industry, from any number of lobbies. Her husband's company. That's right. Now, he brings up an important challenge that I hear from folks all across the district. And one dynamic of this is certainly healthcare costs, prescription drug costs. But working families are having a hard time with the costs of daily life. Yeah, that's inflation. Yeah, that's gas prices. But it's also about childcare and affordable housing and the healthcare and prescription drugs. There have been efforts uh, right now with a very thin majority in Congress to move forward solutions to help working families with the rising costs of things. But obstructionists like Congresswoman Stefanik and some of her allies have stood in the way. <coughs> they consistently vote against our interests and vote against opportunities to reduce costs for working families. And the only conclusion that I can draw, in addition to potentially being on the take from those corporate PACs, is they believe that Americans being in pain <coughs> is a political opportunity for them. And we need to be able to recognize that. That in each of these instances where she's voted against our interests and prevented us from making progress to actually addressing the needs for working families, it's because they want to see us in pain. Which is going to lead me to the next question. Where did you get your finance from? Working very, very hard from folks like you, five, ten dollars at a clip, whatever it may be. Uh, we're relentless in trying to spread the word about this campaign. I have sworn off any corporate PAC contribution. <laughs> we're taking a pledge against that. Uh, we've been fortunate to receive other uh, political PAC contributions, whether it be from unions, uh, organizations like Vote Vets, which is a sort of left-leaning, uh, veteran-backed uh, organization for national security candidates, et cetera. Uh, but working hard and making sure that folks understand that this is an important race. And so while here in the district, yes, we'll uh, always appreciate the support for, for this campaign, but this is also a campaign that requires us to make sure folks across the nation understand the significance of it. So we've been reaching out to donors uh, who want to get engaged in this, but it's all individual donors, no, no corporate uh, political action committee. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So you mentioned that the Biden administration may be botching the messaging on a lot of their current bills. What are your plans to ensure that you stay on top of that message, and what specifically are you going to do um, to make sure you hammer the campaign? Yeah. Um, you did want to conduct what she has. Well, we're going to be relentless, uh, especially as we pivot right into this general election with your support, in calling her to task on some of those issues that we think matter most to folks. I think when we talk about her voting against veterans' interests, this is a district that is home to the largest number of veterans of any in New York. And when folks here, when I talk to folks at American Legion and VFWs, and I hear from folks who say, yeah, you know what, I like you know, Congresswoman Stefanik. And I ask them, okay, why? Well, you know, she supports our, our military and she supports our veterans. I'm like, well, can I share some information with you? She's actually voting against our interests. She's actually an absentee member of the House Armed Services Committee, not looking out for our national security interests. And folks start to say, oh, I'm gonna have to look into that a little bit more. So we're not just gonna do that in person, which I'll do relentlessly and make sure we're, we're communicating to anyone and everyone, but those dollars that we do collect, that enables us to scale our messaging. So it's in people's mailboxes. It's gonna be through phone calls from our volunteers. It's gonna be on your television screens. Uh, our ability to message to make sure that folks understand that there is a serious risk by continuing any representation from Congressman Stefanik to our community, to our future. Hmm. Sure. Um, it seems the one thing that <coughs> just explodes in this area is the gun issues. Yeah. It, it seems to pit people against each other on um, the we're gonna take your guns away sort of thing. I mean, do you have any idea how we're gonna start bringing people back together? Yeah. Because I'm a gun owner, right. um, but I believe that there should be control on those guns. You know, um, they should be, you know, like storing them safely, um, people being checked out. Yep before they're able to buy a gun, like a waiting period. You know, it's like a handgun registration where you have to go through steps yeah. to have certain guns. But every time, um, even uh, I felt like Hochul 
tries to bring uh, um, anything up, it's like people go absolutely crazy and start to think that they're going to take our guns yeah. away. And I've been waiting years for my guns to be taken away, but that hasn't happened. You know, um, do you have any ideas on something we could do to, to bring those everybody together on guns? certainly do, and I think that this is a great opportunity in a campaign to do just that, to push back against the, the vision that has occurred so easily in the wedges of the past. I swore an oath to the Constitution. That includes the Second Amendment. I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and this is an American freedom. Much like we were just talking about uh, access and, and control over a you know, woman's body and her own health care decisions, much like we talked about you know, gay marriage and the ability to be who you are, this is an American freedom that we need to protect as well. And that's why I think you have uh, such a potential you know, snap response at times when there is a threat to that American freedom, because there have been some threats to that in the past. But we have to recognize right now this moment that we're in. I'm somebody that carried firearms throughout the line of duty, throughout my tenure in the CIA, in war zones, I know how to handle them, and I know how to uh, protect uh, in a responsible gun ownership way. And I think what's wonderful about much of the North Country we have lawful gun owners, we have folks that know how to be responsible gun owners, and we're a wonderful example for the rest of the country about how to be responsible gun owners. But we are in a unique moment, I think, in American history, where we've seen this unprecedented level of gun violence, not just in our communities, but even in our classrooms. And there's a desire on my part to make sure that parents have a right to know that their kids are gonna survive the school day. And there's some common sense that we can bring to bear to make sure that we are protecting our kids and communities and respect the rights of lawful gun owners. And a lot of that is around common sense. And so you hit the nail on the head in terms of bringing people together rather than pushing us apart. The majority of us who are lawful gun owners support the Second Amendment, and those of us who wanna keep our kids and communities safe agree that we should keep firearms out of the hands of someone that's gonna do themselves or others harm. Common sense background checks, red flag opportunities, making sure our law enforcement are empowered, making sure that they have the right information, that they're not being put under a heightened threat because they're outgunned uh, from those folks who may do harm to our communities. So these are the areas where we can come together. And I think we can all applaud and appreciate the fact that Washington actually did something on a bipartisan basis very recently. They came together and recognized that. Washington every once in a while can work and produce some legislation that reflects both parties coming together to recognizing a challenge. Now there's more work to be done in that regard, but I think toning down the rhetoric, making sure folks understand the Second Amendment's not going anywhere. I'm going to always protect it, and I'm going to protect people's Second Amendment rights. But that also means we can protect our kids and communities by coming forward with common sense, uh, responsible gun ownership, responsible legislation to keep our kids and communities safe. question is about AK-47, which I'm not, yeah, a uh, semi-automatic rifle, because there's a lot of, I think, misnomers in this world about automatic weapons. We actually don't have access to automatic weapons. I carried an automatic weapon, an automatic rifle in uh, war zones, but there is legislation that's been long since passed that prohibits the, your average civilian from having access to specific weapons of war. Now, there are some questions around high capacity uh, rifles, semi-automatic rifles, I think it, this is where we get start starting to get mired in. What are we doing? Who's making the decisions? Are lawful gun owners involved? Are we talking about regulations? We're impacting a constitutional right. And so if we bring lawful gun owners and those who support the Second Amendment into the conversation, we can start talking about that. But the way the wedge is issued by folks like Congresswoman Stefanik and her uh, husband who works for a gun lobby, they wanna make sure that every criminal Every domestic abuser, every terrorist has unfettered access to firearms. So that's one extreme. And we have others on another end of the extreme who might want to abolish the Second Amendment and ban all kinds of guns. The middle ground is, I think, the ground we were just talking about. And so rather than focusing at this moment around a specific kind of weapon system, I think we focus on any firearm being kept out of the hands of somebody that's going to do themselves and others harm. Because the moment that we have in front of us is one of urgency. Gun violence is now the number one killer of, of kids. And so if the, our children are dying as a result of this, it, it requires us all to come to bear. 
the number one responsibility for government is to keep our citizens safe. And I take that responsibility seriously as somebody who spent a career trying to protect our country and our community. And so I think that's where the focus needs to be at this moment. I think one of the things that uh, we need to be advocate for in Congress would be for veterans, Social Security, Medicare. Number one, this our community is a big retirement community. We have a son that's 21 years in the Army. All right, um, and and I work in an ambulance service. And at one time, I had to fight because veterans were getting bills. If they didn't have a heart problem, they had a heart attack afterwards. You know, because the veterans weren't paying. Right. And then when you see this burn pit change, someone dropped the ball. And, and we're doing that, and it's not just one, it's several. So there's common sense issues that, that are just being thrown at the wayside. Now we're seeing whether scare tactics or not. Now we're seeing where Medicare is going to be challenged in a very few years. Social Security is going to be challenged, whereas my grandkids may not be able to get Social Security. We've got to have somebody that's going to advocate somebody that's going to stand up and say we can't let it happen what's gone on what i've seen in the last year and a half more than anything was when mcconnell stood up and said we don't care about the american people we got to stop the biden agenda right. until biden got a tax stimulus in there that helped his state all right you've got to help your constituents you don't work for the republican party you don't work for the democrat party you work for the people that vote for that's where your paycheck comes from. And they've forgotten about that. So that's what we gotta have in Congress. Advocates for us, yeah. especially in those categories because veterans are the strength of this country. Yeah. I mean, do you wanna join our campaign and be our message? <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. Um, no, especially, there are so many things I wanna comment on. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is thank you for your service because I know that our family members of our service members are also serving on the behalf of the American people in supporting them, particularly back to your homes. Thank you for your son's service, thank you for your service. Um, on, on the veterans front, I don't understand why there would be any question about making sure our veterans have access to the kinds of healthcare, education benefits that we believe that they are entitled to. They served us under the presumption that we were gonna take care of them after their service. Presumption, that's the big word. Presumption of entitlement. That's my belief, that every single time we're talking about veterans' health care, we should be operating from a presumption of entitlement and not putting our veterans in a position where they've gotta fight tooth and nail to justify right. the, the care that they warrant or require. The other piece of this, and this gets back to a top challenge I hear throughout the district, is about access to care, access to services. That applies to everybody, right? We've seen our healthcare facilities close. We've seen primary care physicians uh, disappear. It's not just about our acute clinical healthcare resources. It's also about mental health resources. It's about substance abuse, behavioral health. In order to make sure that those things are in, in our uh, area that people can access, particularly our veterans, they need to be in our community. We expect our veterans to hop on a transportation bus and you know travel three hours down to Syracuse or to Albany or wherever it may be. Those are the kinds of services we need to be providing within our community. And I think we can all agree that our veterans are entitled to those kinds of services. Well, the best way we can make sure that again, they can access them is making them available in the communities where they live. So that's my belief there. My parents are both seniors. And so Social Security and Medicare are very personal to me. I want to make sure that we're not only protecting those things, we're expanding them. And so particularly on the Medicare front, we want to make sure that we're expanding it to cover dental, uh, vision, hearing. These are areas that we want to make sure that we're shoring up these programs so that they are, are going to be longstanding for future generations like me and, uh, and others, uh, but certainly that they're going to be there for uh, our current seniors like my parents. Now, I don't trust Congresswoman Stefanik with many things. Certainly don't trust her with my parents' Medicare and Social Security. Not someone who was the architect to dismantle both programs when she was helping out Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan the president, exactly. many years ago. And so this is a top issue because we've seen from folks like her friend uh, Rick Scott down in Florida, their plan if they get control in Congress is to sunset these programs in five years. Yep. You think dysfunction in Washington is gonna allow for us to uh, reestablish those programs? I don't think so. This is their plan all along. 
And so this is an opportunity to make sure that particularly our seniors and those of us who care for our seniors know that this election has significant consequences across the board. And these are things that at least I'm always gonna be an advocate for. And again, I'm gonna harken back to what you just said. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or if you're a Republican, you're elected to represent the people that you were elected to represent. And the expectation should be, I think on all of us who are voters, that we're evaluating our elected representatives on that metric, not how good of a Republican or Democrat they were, not how good they were at fighting with the other side, it's how good they were in representing our interests. And in that measure, Congresswoman Stefanik has failed time and time again. What's your feeling on taking the cap off Social Security? Uh, to, from the Social Security uh, tax cap to, right. to raising it from the right. hundred and whatever thousand yeah. dollars right. it may be. Uh, I, I think that's an area that we would want to explore to making sure we have Social Security that's solvent. Uh, I think right now it's probably at a level that hasn't kept up with uh, current income levels in many decades, certainly inflation, right. and we want to be able to explore that. That's a simple solution to help improve solvency for Social Security for exactly. many years to come. The little guy never gets a chance. The big guy, he's, he's freaking yeah. up. Yeah. But it's, it's about time that all of our tax policy really centers around middle class working families right. to make sure that we're prioritizing them and not benefiting the you know big dollar billionaires and millionaires and corporations. Uh, the concept of trickle down economics was a myth. It never worked. And I'll spread the blame around. Both parties over many decades uh, were uh, guilty of promoting that and thinking that somehow our entire community was going to benefit and our our population was gonna benefit from trickle-down economics. It never happened. We just saw their incomes go higher and higher and higher. And the basic needs for our seniors, uh, for our middle class, for working families, were not met. And our communities are not better as a result of that. Right. What about Biden's approach to Ukraine and Russia? How would you handle that? Yeah, great question. Um, so, I'm gonna start off with saying, again, true to form, country before party, I've been critical of this administration's approach to some national security issues, particularly we're now about the one year anniversary from the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I spent much of my career focused on Afghanistan, served yeah. in Afghanistan, it's heartbreaking for me to see that happen. Uh, I could spread a lot of blame around. Trump and Pompeo signed a surrender deal that really was the original sin. Congress, like Congresswoman Stefanik, were asleep at the wheel. They didn't actually provide oversight of that war. But I'm critical of the Biden administration there. I'm gonna give them a tremendous amount of credit about how they've handled Ukraine. Because the challenge that they were handed from the prior administration were at least four years, if not more time, uh, invested by Russia, Vladimir Putin, in trying to undermine the unity of NATO, in trying to promote populism throughout, not just the United States and interfering in our elections, but also in Europe. You know, Brexit, we've seen other examples in which uh, foreign European countries or Western European partners we're trying to break apart from the European Union and questioning you know, the rise of nationalism. And Russia was trying to invest in creating that. When some folks talk about would the invasion of Ukraine have happened if uh, you know, Donald Trump was president? Absolutely it would. Because it happened right now during this administration because Putin made an investment. He made an investment over the last decade in trying to break apart NATO unity and his invasion of Ukraine was uh, trying to cash in on that. But the Biden administration, to their credit, realized what Putin was up to. And I, I will say that my former colleagues at the CIA and the intelligence community did a great job of being able to detect what Putin's intentions were. They shared that information not just with the administration, administration with diplomacy, recognizing that while America is the strongest nation in the world, we are stronger when we're working with our partners and allies, went to NATO and said, listen, here's what Putin's planning on doing. He's planning on invading Ukraine. Unified NATO got them to operate as one, brought on board our European partners, and then took that same intelligence and broadcast to the world, this is what Putin's planning on doing, to prevent him from having a false veneer for his actions. And one of the greatest weapons we have in this conflict is the low morale of Russian troops. They don't believe in what they're doing right now. And we've been able to support Ukraine with a tremendous amount of resources, not just unilaterally the United States, it's important to underscore that NATO is bearing their fair share on this as well, and we should continue to hold them to account on that regard. It shouldn't always be the United States, but we wanna make sure that uh, Ukraine is in a position to defend itself and to fight back against its invasion, because they're a democracy, and we must defend democracy abroad, just like we should do it here at home. 
Sorry if I got a little wonky there. I do, I do have a little experience in the national security realm. What's your take on uh, China, all the stuff yeah, that comes China. in in China? Yeah, I mean, it's a similar regard in terms of the principle there. Uh, and China and Taiwan is a confusing challenge. Uh, Long-standing U.S. policy has been a one-China policy. We recognize that China is one, but we also recognize that Taiwan, as being a democracy, is entitled to self-governance. And we're always going to protect the interests of a democracy. And we want to make sure that they're not um, attacked. We want to make sure that uh, they're not abused or harassed. And it's a tenuous sort of situation here. It's also one that I think that there's bipartisan uh, recognition about what US policy should be there and how we should maintain strength in communicating to the Chinese not to harass Taiwan. Do you have any ideas about how we'll bring our industry back from Asia and back to the US? We have been promised that. Yeah. Trump said, well, look at here, these are coming back. And yeah. Before they even settled down, yeah. 200 more jobs went over. Right. Well, one opportunity just was passed into law over the past two weeks or so called the CHIPS Act. Yeah. This is incredibly important. And here's why. Not only is it an opportunity to bring good paying union jobs back here, some of which to northern New York. There's a lot of work that's going to be done. It's going to benefit folks who work in our district. The capital region, some of the southern portions over in um, Oneida County. There's a lot of chip manufacturing that can benefit from this boost of resources. So good paying jobs coming here, coming back from overseas, because right now Asia is now making a tremendous number of the chips that are basically in everything. If you have an electronic device, and I'm talking about your cell phone, your washing machine, your refrigerator, your vehicle, all of them require these, um, these chips. And one of the challenges that we've had in terms of inflation has been we haven't had access to chips because supply chains were disrupted during the pandemic. And so for all of those goods, prices went up. It's one of the key drivers for inflation. And so one of the key aspects is being able to make sure that that supply chain begins and ends right here, that we're not reliant on these foreign supply chains. So it's an opportunity to make that kind of investment in our economy, American economy, to help boost those goods, to reduce costs for families, to protect our national security, because some of those things are incorporated in our national security, technology and whatnot, and to make sure that we're bringing jobs right here. Another area, by the way, and I'm sorry to inform you of this, Congresswoman Stefanik voted against it. That's right. <laughs> Adding on to that, so we get manufacturing jobs, chips, and things like that starting to come back into the States. How do you prevent companies from doing it all over again? Oh, from leaving? To, to yeah. just send it back out. Yeah, we want to make sure that we're incentivizing, either from a tax basis and also penalizing. Uh, I think that there are also, we want to make sure that we're addressing the talent pool and making sure that that, that brain drain isn't leaving the area. So investments that we're making in our local economy help to retain that kind of talent to help grow those businesses. So there are things that the government can and should be doing. There are things that we should be doing at least in terms of, I think the key lesson from the pandemic is we cannot be so reliant on foreign supply chains. Um, as a matter of national security, as a matter of resiliency within our own local economy. And this even applies to agriculture. You know, our food supply, our food production. Uh, we want to make sure that we're making investments in, in, in buying local and producing local. And so I think that there's a policy orientation around that that can create that kind of resiliency to hopefully prevent against that from happening in the future. All right, I think I'm getting the hook right now for the, the broader session, but we've got a couple of minutes here. We'd love to take some one-on-one -on -one questions. One more quick question. Okay. What was your dad's name? Because I worked for IBM. Oh, did you? Yes. Uh, Jack. Okay. And then, yeah. Castella. Where at? Uh, the Hudson Valley, so okay. I Gipsy was, area. I was in Florida and North Carolina, okay. and I worked from home here. Oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you for your support. Thank you.